Hey, um, I guess I think we might get started. So welcome everyone. Um, wherever you're watching around the world, we're happy to have all of you here for the latest Macquarie Center for Environmental Law, Law and Nature Dialogue. Um, I'd just like to start first off with a acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Um, oh, sorry, I've just had an issue there. Um, we're very excited to have presenting for us today, Dr. Nilfar Oral. I'm sure Dr. Oral needs little introduction given her incredible reputation across the fields of international environmental law and law of the sea. Uh, the reason I'm sure many of you are here today. Nevertheless, I'll just say briefly, Dr. Oral is the Director for the Center of International Law at the National University of Singapore. She's a member of the UN International Law Commission and co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law. She was also the second vice chair of the International Law Commission in 2019. Between 2009 and 2016, she was a climate change negotiator for the Turkish ministry, and she's appeared before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. She's published numerous articles, edited several books, and spoken at many international conferences, and I'm sure most of us are familiar with her outstanding scholarship. So we're very honored to have her presenting for us today. Um, as a quick point of housekeeping, if you have any questions for Dr. Aral through the presentation, please feel free to answer them in the chat, um, and we'll have time at the end uh, to go through some of them. Also, um, we might we will be having a brief intermission at about uh, half, in half about half an hour into our presentation. Um, and we might just use that time to organize a few of your questions and things like that, and then we'll get back to it. Um, now, as you're all uh, aware, I'm sure, there's ongoing negotiation uh, at the United Nations uh, for an international instrument um, for the conservation of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And I think there's no better person to familiarize us with these BB&J negotiations than Dr. Ora herself. Her presentation is titled Towards a New BBNJ Agreement, Negotiating a New Treaty for the Conservation of Marine Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. And I'll now ask Dr. Aral to take us through her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ethan, so much for that extremely uh, generous introduction. I'm not sure I merit it all, but I do appreciate it. And, and, and I thank uh, the center uh, for this invitation, and I know that they've done a tremendous series. May I also not add that I've known Nangui for many years, as well as Michelle. Uh, so I, it's a, it's really makes it m even more special uh, to be here and part of this series and the great work that the center is doing. Um, I also see on this Zoom some familiar names. Um, so welcome to those of you, and it's great to see you at least your names. <laughs> on the Zoom screen, and thank you, all of you, for taking the time to join me today um, to talk about a topic that um, I have been following for many years. I'm not sure I would be the most qualified. There are many um, uh, colleagues who really are truly experts and have been closely involved. Now, what I'm going to do, of course, is uh, get to my PowerPoint. Oops. Let's hope. Let's hope that goes that goes uh, without a problem. <laughs> Got it. Oops. Did I close it? Sorry. I think I closed it. One more time. There we go. All right. Um, all right. Okay. So uh, first of all, very good. So um, this is. Um, uh, the, my presentation is to give you some background on the ongoing negotiations for uh, a new agreement, which will basically be an implementing agreement to the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention um, for protection of the area we call beyond national jurisdiction. That includes, of course, the high seas, the water column, and well, we'll see, because <clears throat> the area beyond national jurisdiction also goes beyond um, the area of the con of the seafloor and seabed. This is an area, but it's the area and uh, continental shelf that's under <clears throat> national jurisdiction. But let's go back a little bit to history. Um, so actually, it's way back uh, in the eight, uh, 1800s 
that the first expedition, scientific expedition, the famous HMS Challenger, went out and basically launched marine um, scientific expeditions and discovered the Mariana Trench. And it took over 100 years to get back to the Mariana Trench. Uh, it's quite deep. But now we see, I mean, I just thought to put the difference, how technology has changed um, from the old mass ships to now these submersibles, the incredible technology we have to go into the deep uh, ocean. And that is an important issue that also highlights um, the negotiations for this new agreement as well. So I'm going to go through why a new agreement, just highlight some of the provisions under the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, where we are with the negotiations, its current status, and some questions about the future. So why a new agreement? Well, many of you may already know, but we know that actually 60% of the ocean is high seas. Um, and this means it's an area beyond national jurisdiction. And essentially, it's a common area where no state can exercise that important regulatory, prescriptive, and enforcement jurisdiction, particularly for protection of the marine environment beyond the flag state jurisdiction, which really is very limited. Um, and we have, of course, uh, codified under uh, customary international law uh, in the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, the principle of high seas freedoms, which is very important and the open access regime, particularly for natural resources um, of the high seas. But we also know that the natural resources of the high seas are not infinite and they have been depleted. They have been overexploited. This started way back um, in the uh, 19th century with whaling. Now for decades, scientists had been calling for protection of the high seas and one of the most well-known, of course, is Sylvia Earle. Um, but um, according to my um, um, research, despite the very rich biodiversity and the need of protection, very, it's, it's, it's barely protected basically. And we also had very limited knowledge about life in the high seas and deep oceans. In fact, the common saying was, we know more about the, the moon, the surface of the moon, than we do about the deep ocean. However, that is changing, that's the good news. Between 2000 and 2010, very important census of marine life was undertaken. It was a huge project where some 2,700 scientists from around the world, and this is an important part of science, it's global, it's international, from 80 nations with some 540 marine expeditions went out and discovered new species, continued to discover new species. Um, I mean, um, and, and they're still doing that. And so we've discovered a whole new life in the deep ocean. Um, but that means also um, marine life that really they did not expect. And you've heard of the extremophiles. Um, you've heard of these deep sea creatures that create their own luminosity, their own light, because the deep ocean is virtually black. So the scientists did not think that there would be much life, but surprise, there is. But we also know that they found pieces of plastic <laughs> at the bottom, you know, in the, in the deep ocean sea. So it is an area that is being impacted by human activities. Climate change, while it impacts mostly the surface of the ocean, it will also start impacting the deep sea as well. But again, we're concerned with the whole water column that lies beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, we are now in the period of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So the ocean is, is in the public eye, it is garnering attention, uh, and this is important. And so in that sense, I think that um, the, the convention, the negotiations, I should say, have played a very critical role in promoting and highlighting the importance of the ocean. And it is coming at a good time. And hopefully this will be uh, motivational to get this, <laughs> this uh, convention uh, eventually adopted or agreement, I should say. So anyway, these are just some you know, photos of uh, some interesting creatures 
that are down deep. Uh, um, there are many, many of them. And if you have the time, I suggest you look at these. They've also discovered deep sea coral reefs, cold sea coral reefs. Importantly are the hydrothermal vents. Um, and these hydrothermal vents are fissures in the sea and kind of like, it looks like lava going out. Um, but um, they, they are uh, exuding um, minerals and gaseous, very valuable, but also unique and important for biodiversity. These hydrothermal vents support unique ecosystems. Um, and also they are important for regulating uh, the ocean chemistry and circulation. And again, these are hydrothermal vents, are areas, are ecosystems that also need to be protected. And seamounts in the deep sea, in the, in the ocean. Um, so seamounts are under threat as well from particularly fishing activities, um, but they also have very rich biodiversity. You see the red parts, the rich biodiversity of the peaks of the seamounts which provide um, habitat um, and the, you know the story perhaps of the Patagonian toothfish. It's a discrete fish that basically was, was you know, overfished. Um, and so again, these are areas, it's not just about fishing though, it's protecting the ecosystem, it's protecting the habitats because this is an issue that comes up um, is the uh, new agreement about mostly about fishing or not. And this is just a map to show, of course, how much high seas, how much of the earth really is beyond the protection of coastal states. One of the issues, of course, an important issue behind this new agreement is the problem of fragmentation. And we hear this word a lot, but here's a diagram. I can't take credit for it, but, um, but every, you know, the, the way that the law of the sea environmental issues um, either that it can encompass uh, ocean matters has developed thematically. Um, so we have, um, we have fisheries, um, we have the regional fisheries management organizations. Then of course we have the CBD, we have the law of the sea convention, we have the international maritime organization for shipping, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question is how to create a more holistic, collaborative system where you don't have duplication, you don't have overlap, or you don't have competition. Um, so the agreement is an opportunity to provide a legal framework for this. Now let's look quickly at some of the unclosed provisions that are key. Um, and the Law of the Sea Convention, I, you know, I have to say that from the perspective of the marine environmental provisions, part 12, it is really um, probably uh, one of the strongest instruments we have, if not the strongest at the global level, because we also have regional instruments. But when you look at Article 192, very clear uh, obligation that states had the duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. This is not um, diluted by shall endeavor, shall do their best, but it's, it's a straightforward obligation. It also includes obligations for states to take either uh, individually <clears throat> or in cooperation, all measures, all measures consistent with the convention, of course, that are necessary to prevent, reduce, control pollution of the marine environment. Um, also, there's an important part of this Article 194 that concerns the obligation for states to take those measures also necessary to protect rare or fragile ecosystems, including the habitats of depleted, endangered, or threatened species and other forms of marine life. So in 1982, this is before the Convention on Biological Diversity, this was really a prescient provision because at that time, to be quite honest, the focus was on pollution, but we see here the understanding that it's more than pollution, that you have to also protect fragile ecosystems. And certainly um, the ocean has, um, we see a lot of these fragile ecosystems and sadly many threatened species. So, um, uh, so the, the Law of the Sea Convention really makes very clear in several of its provisions 
Uh, and I've just highlighted some of them. There are more actually, particularly due to cooperate. And we have lots of provisions on protection against all different sources of pollution and threats. Um, so, and it includes the high seas. I mean, that's what's important. There is not a division. There's nothing here that we're restricted only to coastal areas. Uh, and this is important. So the states have a duty um, um, to protect the marine environment that includes in the high seas. They have a duty to cooperate. They have the duty to take all the necessary measures. And therefore you see that the convention lays all the legal foundation for states to, to have an obligation actually to take those measures to protect the high seas. So how did this go about? Well, as I said earlier, for decades, scientists had been calling for such protective measures in the high seas. Civil society joined in. There was an historic meeting in 2001 in Vilm where they, I think that's really officially determined the place where they launched the idea of the BB&J agreement. This eventually was taken to the UN. The UN has an informal consultative process, which is kind of the starting point. It's the, it's the breeding ground for um, scientists and experts under the United Nations system to, to discuss, exchange views about different topics um, concerning the law of the sea, in this case, the ocean. They've had it on sea level rise recently, but um, back <clears throat> at that time in the early 2000s, they had it um, on uh, what we call, now call BBNJ, um, protection of biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And um, after many years of these meetings they had, um, finally, an agreement was reached to move forward with developing an international legally binding instrument. So in 2015, it's a really a landmark decision. And I should say, I think for those of you involved in international law, it is not easy these days to get states to agree to develop a new treaty. There are so many treaties, we hear about treaty fatigue. So this really is quite an accomplishment. And it really is the work of um, a diverse group and civil society also had a very strong voice in this. Uh, so the decision in 2015 was to establish a preparatory committee that would meet for two years for, and, that, and the report of the preparatory committee would be the recommendations, but all with the view of, heading, of um, negotiating a new agreement. That was completed in 2017, and then the General Assembly adopted another resolution, and this time it was for that important next step, which was to convene, adopt a resolution for the convening of an intergovernmental conference. That means now the negotiations will start. States will meet under the auspices of the United Nations based on the recommendations of the preparatory committee and start negotiating um, a new international legally binding instrument, having given it a full uh, uh, a name, protocol, agreement. In short, they call it the ILB. And it was to have the, uh, again, two years, four sessions. And unfortunately, when it came time to the Intergovernmental Conference Four, which was, was to have been held in August, 2021, what happened? The pandemic. So it's kind of like a suspense, suspense movie because we get coming to the last leg um, and now it had to be suspended, postponed. Um, now I understand that they're looking to March, 2022 to have this last meeting. Now also um, just to uh, tell you that there, what we call the elements of the package de deal, it was agreed to in 2011, this was, um, that, that any such agreement would contain four components. Marine genetic resources, including questions on the sharing of benefits, measures such as area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments, capacity building, and the transfer of marine technology. So these are the four um, components. So where are we today? Um, well, <clears throat> 
The president of the uh, BB&J process is uh, Ambassador Rena Lee from Singapore. I know her well. I know her actually from climate change negotiations. So she has been, uh, of course, working with the Secretariat of the Division for Oceans, um, Joe Alos. Um, and, and um, all right, I have the photos here. And, and now what they're working on right now is the IGC president's revised draft. And you can find it online. And basically it is um, a reflection of the views of state. So you don't really have, um, um, it, 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 it's far from, it's a lot of things are still in brackets, frankly, many things. Um, so what I want to do is just highlight the issues that really have yet to be decided. To be quite honest, even though we're into the fourth IGC, there, is, there are still many, many outstanding issues. Starting from what's the objective? What are the applicable principles? Um, some states will put in a whole list of principles, of course, precautionary, um, ecosystem-based management. Um, some want just de minimis. The big the big debate, of course, is on the common heritage of mankind. And if you're familiar with the common heritage of mankind, um, under the law of the Sea Convention, of course, <clears throat> we have a whole regime under part 11 for implementing uh, the principle of the common heritage of mankind for the resources, the natural resources in the area. And it's a very sophisticated, um, complex regime that entails benefit sharing. And so with the post-1982, in fact, fairly recent discovery of marine genetic resources, um, there is now a very strong um, movement, a very strong, I think, key, it's absolutely a key component to this whole agreement, is to include marine genetic resources as part of the common heritage of mankind regime or at least apply that principle to marine genetic resources from the high seas. And the reason is that marine genetic resources have become very, very valuable. A lot of the pharmaceuticals coming out now from cancer treatments are based on marine genetic resources, uh, beauty products. Although I would say the, the great part right now from national jurisdiction, but increasingly looking to this area of the high seas, where only a handful of corporations and, <clears throat> and states really can access that. And this is a very um, critical issue. Other problem, other issues that come up is this, there's a, a, the caveat in the um, resolutions that the new treatment shall not undermine existing regimes. And this is particularly for the fisheries, for the regional seas, um, the International Maritime Organization and shipping, because they are existing regimes. But what does that mean not to undermine? Um, and does, under, does not to undermine prevent cooperation and collaboration? It shouldn't. Um, but these are the issues that really uh, remain and need to be um, clarified so that they do not prevent um, what the goal would be is an effective a regime for the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction. Then there's also the question of adjacency and specially affected states. Um, and that has to do with measures are taken that are close to the national jurisdiction, the EEZs of other states, whether there should be some special um, provision um, and consultation with them in decision-making. We also have, of course, always a problem of non-parties to so the law of the sea convention. For example, Turkey is a non-party, um, although in the fish stocks agreement, um, non-parties, uh, for example, the United States became parties to the fish stocks agreement. So, um, so these are just, you know, some, so there's still a lot of issues that are outstanding, but the big one without question concerns the status of marine genetic resources. Um, now, um, First of all, um, one of the issues is, is it scientific research? Because we know there's freedom of scientific research under the Law of the Sea Convention, or is it bioprospecting? 
And the reason is, is that what may start off as scientific research ends up being commercialized. And so one of the issues is how to trace and track this. And it's very important for the developing states because the developing states are very adamant that the new agreement has to provide for an equitable benefit sharing process. And the question is how this will be done. Um, and that is how the common heritage principle comes in. And it starts from the very beginning. One of the issues, very important in developing how it will be reflected in the agreement is something called pre and post cruise notification. So according to the developing states, they have even a proposal for a mechanism where um, uh, uh, scientific research uh, for, bi uh, for uh, marine genetic um, resources before the expedition would have to give notice. And this could possibly be through a clearinghouse mechanism. Um, and, that, um, uh, and the reason is, is to give you know, different reasons. One, let everyone know that there's a cruise going out. And of course, an important part about scientific research is to internationalize it, to bring in other um, states, particularly from the developing countries. Um, so, but this is debated, whether it's necessary, you have certain states that disagree with this. How about post-cruise notification? Uh, when, how? Traceability is a, it's a big issue with marine genetic resources because you can just take one sample, no one would know, and then it goes to computers and laboratories and, and can change the different, um, uh, will be you know, developed from there and there's very little way of tracing it. So how to create a system that will ensure transparency as well. And of course, how to share the benefits. Um, for example, the developed states like to make a distinction between monetary and non-monetary, but the developing states, uh, I should say the other way around, but the developing states want to make clear that there are monetary benefits that need to be shared and non-monetary. And these have all been developed. There are proposals on how to do this. Um, so uh, also very important uh, area-based management tools. So remember, we're going in an area where no state has um, exercises jurisdiction. So, you know, what, how will this be decided? What will the mechanism be? What levels of protection? What will the designation process be? For example, uh, we already have from the Convention on Biological Diversity, EPSIS, right? Um, will those be used? How will the consultation process be used? Um, and, um, and these. Um, all right, so on area-based management, so again, um, we're talking about um, establishing, you know, large, I would say, marine protected areas um, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Now, there are precedents that we already have. Those are within the regional seas. Um, uh, context. And of course, one of the big issues from an international law perspective is the opposability. Um, so the international, this agreement would actually broaden um, the states that would have to recognize and actually abide by the measures taken, assuming that we create that process um, that will allow for such a framework. And again, what's important, and this whole goes into this relationship with other regimes, how will it uh, interact with, obviously, the fisheries is a very important aspect of this, the regional fisheries management organizations, that some of them do have mandates that would include uh, high seas areas, shipping, of course, in particular with the IMO. Um, so these are some of the challenges that really have not yet been determined, and this fourth session is a critical one for that. Um, environmental impact assessments. Again, we're talking state has a jurisdiction other than the flag state jurisdiction. Um, so the questions that still have to be um, agreed upon, what are the triggering events? What are the thresholds? Transient harm, significant harm, will it include cumulative? No. Okay. Um, also, will it include um, strategic environmental impact assessment, which of course, you know, is a much broader approach? Um, and who's gonna be responsible? 
who will be responsible for doing this environmental impact? Is it impact the states, the operators, or will there be a scientific committee? Um, and ultimately who pays? How will the monitoring and review be done? We know that um, there are provisions in the Law of the Sea Convention, Article 206, 205, that while they're not called environmental impact assessments, of course, that's basically um, what it involves. And there is this um, obligation to report um, to uh, basically the interna international body, which hasn't really been determined, you know, who and, and how that would operate. So the agreement gives an opportunity to implement that. Very important. And again, this is another area where there's a lot of discussion not yet agreed on is capacity building and transfer of marine scientific technology. And to make it just as simple, because I know we're running out of time, um, is it an obligation? Do, is there an obligation by the developed states to provide capacity building and transfer of marine scientific technology? Or is it really what we call the should or the may category of not necessarily an obligation, but certainly something to be encouraged? And this is very much related to um, the MGR question of benefit sharing, particularly when we get into the distinction between monetary and non-monetary. A non-monetary being that, okay, capacity building, um, developed states happy to provide training, bring you on scientific cruises, but how far does that go? Is that enough? Um, and, and why not make it an obligation? Why not have some very strict parameters, particularly for the transfer of marine scientific technology? And here we know that there are issues of uh, intellectual property rights, um, but I know through the climate change um, regime, they do have a, a technology uh, trans, uh, mechanism there that could be looked at as well. So these are what I'm giving you. These are the issues that really uh, have not been resolved, including the institutional structures. One of the, everything seems to focus on the clearinghouse mechanism and what the role of that clearinghouse mechanism will be because everything is going into there, all the information. Uh, and so it's turned into be something quite critical. Should there be a compliance mechanism? Enforcement is different from the compliance we know. Um, so, so uh, and, and then the financial resources, for example, developing states are hesitant to have Jeff as a financial mechanism. They would like to have something independent of that. Dispute settlement, one of the issues again, should the dispute settlement provisions of part 15 in the Law of the Sea Convention be adopted mutus mutandis or should it be recalibrated? What about non-parties? Uh, you know, the fish stocks agreement is an example, although it also includes an ad hoc panel of experts. Um, I think there is a, an appetite for looking at a compliance mechanism in addition for the, um, uh, uh, this new agreement. And also, should it include expressly provision for advisory opinions? Um, and, and that is something we know in the law of the sea convention it applies to the area through the sea, sea, seabed chambers, um, but it was the tribunal, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea that actually recognized its own jurisdiction for general jurisdiction for advisory opinions. So should that be uh, included in the agreement itself? The future, and I'm getting to the end here. So where are we? Will the uh, conference take part in March? Can I say? It seems we're a long way really from um, having convergence on these many critical issues. There have been a whole series of informal dialogues that I've actually been involved in um, to try and have used this period of time for states to discuss, exchange views, and hopefully that will help when the formal negotiations restart to find convergence. Um, the president as well has been holding negotiations uh, I'm not negotiations, um, also these types of dialogues. Um, so will there be then a need for another round of negotiations? And even in the best case scenarios adopted, how long will it take till it actually enters into force? And should there be a provisional application clause, meaning that it would provisionally 
be applied for those states that do sign and ratify it. All right, that's the end. And again, I do apologize so much for that um, brief uh, that I had to be absent. But anyway, I hope what I really wanted to do was basically give you a flavor of what the negotiations are about. Not so much to, to give you the legal details of why there should be an agreement. And, and then I hope we can have some time for some discussion um, on this. So thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it was, that was an excellent overview of the whole BBNJ negotiation and a lot of the key issues. Um, that break actually did serve us quite well in terms of getting a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so what I might do is just go through them. Some of them have been sent to me directly. So I'll, I'll just go through in order um, and pose them to Dr. Aral. And um, if uh, the person behind the question would like to ask it themselves, that's all right as well. Um, but I've received one here from Kavitha who asks, what is the implication of bringing traditional knowledge associated with marine genetic resources to the BBNJ negotiations? Um, so an interesting one there. Absolutely. And in fact, it's a, oh, am I on? Yes, okay. That, that is a very important uh, question because it is um, actually they've added, I think it's a 10 Bs uh, to the president's um, uh, draft um, to include um, uh, uh, traditional and indigenous um, knowledge, particularly in the designation. I have to go back and look, but it is important. And I think that that is something um, that will be actually, will be part of the agreement. I think that um, that was, um, um, that in fact, part of our informal uh, dialogues, we took that issue up um, and um, we had some experts come in to, to talk about it. And I had the sense, this is really my own very personal <laughs> impression um, that, there, that there was an overall favorable. There were just questions about how it would apply. Um, but yeah, I think that that, has, um, that will be reflected in the, the, the final agreement. Okay, thank you. And so we've got um, one here from someone called TGP um, and they've asked me, Will this negotiation process be a forerunner to the development of an agreement on sea level rise and shifting maritime boundaries? Well, boy, there's my favorite topic right there. Um, interesting. Um, as some of you may or may not know, uh, I am also co-chair of the uh, study group on sea level rise uh, for the International Law Commission. And we are working on this issue uh, we just had our first meeting of the open-ended study group looking at the law of the sea issues, related issues on sea level rise. And so your question goes to whether there will be uh, ultimately another agreement on this. Um, and I think that that is kind of the you know, big question because we know that sea level rise is having multiple consequences um, for many, many states directly and even more indirectly, and particularly in the maritime boundaries, and also very important, the status of islands, rocks, and low tide elevations. Um, ideally, yeah, that would be great. I would say ideally, if you could get states together, have a new agreement, but the likelihood of that, we'll see. Um, it's, a, it's a long process. Uh, these types of um, international uh, process uh, negotiations are long, but so the, at the commission, I hope that we're actually promoting a good start to this discussion, which to be quite honest, the small island developing states have been in the leadership for many years. Um, they've made declarations that are very important, and I know the General Assembly, that's going to be one of the issues. Um, so I'm hoping that from the commission, um, there's also been the excellent work of the International Law Association. Um, so we're taking it now to the states. Um, so perhaps that will be the outcome, but it really is very early to tell. I think we've uh, picked the perfect person to answer that question, um, definitely. Um, so the next one in the chat uh, says, uh, is from Kath Wallace, and she says, the common heritage of mankind 
now seems very old fashioned, could we start to reframe the discussion in terms of humans, humans as tenants of the earth in common instead? Not for this negotiation because it's so advanced, but probably we need to change our thinking from human ownership. Yeah, great, great, great to point. Um, first of all, I mean, I could say even the, the terminology is outdated, uh, common heritage of mankind. But when you go back, of course, it was, I mean, part 11 was pretty revolutionary um, at the, for that time. Um, but um, I agree um, to take it away from the human centric uh, uh, approach. And I think your question raises a broader issue as we have these instruments that were you know, negotiated and adopted in a certain period of time, according to certain um, needs and you know, thinking of that time period. And at the time they were very um, perhaps uh, innovative, but things have changed. And now we know from climate change to our approach to the environment, you know, that whole anthropocentric approach, how can we change that? So it goes to the broader question of how can international law be adaptive, be flexible? Uh, and how, what tools do we have to do that? We rely so much on states as well, and maybe we need to get into, you know, the, <laughs> the post-state period. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. I don't have answers, but I think it's really a very important question that entails broader questions of international law process as well and thinking. Yeah, um, so the next one we have has come from Millicent McCreeth, um, and she's asked, to what extent do you think the party's positions may have changed, if at all, during the delay due to the pandemic? Do you think the final agreement will be different? To how it would have been without the pandemic. An interesting one. Yeah, hi Millicent. <laughs> Millicent used to be with us at the center. So um, thanks. Yeah, I think it has. Um, I do. Uh, and the reason I think that um, is that during this time period, there have been two tracks, maybe even I would say a little bit, two and a half, um, of informal meetings, very important. And during these meetings it is given um, delegations an opportunity uh, to have um, the, almost the luxury of listening and understanding better the other, what the other side is saying. Because when you look at negotiations, to be quite honest, one can question, you know, uh, so much of it is done under time pressure um, within a very limited period of time and not really that much opportunity to listen and hear one another. So now they've had that. And I think there is a better understanding. So I'm actually a bit optimistic that this period um, will have helped round certain edges that perhaps uh, would not have happened because of, uh, without the pandemic. Um, and um, so I, I'm a bit, I'm optimistic. I think that, uh, and, and also I think that when they are negotiating, one thing about the BB&J, is that it's had a very good spirit about it. And I will compare it to other, um, I was involved in the climate change negotiations. That was a tough, really tough, very tough group. <laughs> um, this is different. And I think this period has made that even more, shall I say, I, I wanna use the word friendlier, open understanding. Um, so I think it has. Is it to the point where they can agree on all points? I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah, that's a tough one there. But thanks, Millicent. That's a good question. I'm glad to hear that there's some cause for optimism when it comes to when we actually get back to the BB&J negotiations. Um, so the next question comes from Tanya Durham, and she's asked, um, how is the president ensuring an adequate balance in, is being delivered between satisfying the needs of developing states during the negotiations and allowing developed states to use resources to exploit uh, the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, just to understand, so this is um, um, the, the president, uh, uh, Rena Lee. Um, so this is for the negotiations. And in terms of create, that balance is uh, a critical one. It always has been in all negotiations. And I think that it, it it's, it she tries to reflect it, of course, in the president's text, the draft, 
were the different views I represented. Um, and also in the consultation process. And um, one thing that's very important in negotiations, you have regional groups. Um, so the developing states have actually multiple regional groups. Um, you have the G77, then you have, uh, you might have um, specific regional um, thematic groups. So I think that the system is such that it does give developing states in general a strong voice. Now, within those groups, I don't know, I can't speak for that, you know, the individual states. Um, so, but it's an important balance because I will say from past experience that early on, if any of you were part of the follow the climate change in Copenhagen, it was the dissatisfaction of the developing states that really ended up um, kind of, um, you know, preventing a successful conclusion at that time of the Copenhagen Agreement. Um, but that's about all I can say in relation to that question. Okay, we'll move along to the next one, which is from Gennison uh, Vithia. And they've asked, does the treaty provide specific articles for the compliance with the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species to ensure that trade in marine species harvested in ABNJ is conducted in a legal, sustainable and traceable manner? Ah, no, well, uh, the, the current text, and it doesn't specifically uh, provide such language, and, um, and I'm not sure that it would necessarily, but the point is an important one about that interlinkage and, and how uh, the agreement can create, um, again, trying to bridge what we call about that fragmentation and certainly um, abiding with other obligations um, from um, other conventions is an important part, but I'm not sure that um, it would be directly linked in that way. Um, you know, but anyway, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think it's uh, something that maybe doesn't get talked about um, a lot, but, uh, but that connection between the international instruments is very interesting. Um, we have a question from Amber who's asked, uh, does the draft agreement ensure any special provisions to landlocked developing countries? Amber, is this uh, Amber I know? <laughs> um, no, to my recollection, no. Um, I mean, it, it, see, these agreements apply to all states. And the Law of the Sea Convention, of course, does have special provisions for landlocked states. But for the high seas, I guess I would ask, you know, what type of provisions um, would you be thinking about? Um, but certainly it would apply to the landlocked states who, you know, they would also. Um, so I guess maybe the question is, would they have some kind of different status because they're landlocked and, and, and that I don't, you know, that hasn't been discussed to my knowledge. Thank you. So, um... We have, oh, we have one more. This might have to be the last one because we're almost at the end. Uh, so Patricia Parkinson has asked, has any linkages been created with the UNEA process for the global treaty on plastics? So this is what has happened. So from the beginning, you know, this, the, the negotiations for the BBNJ agreement has been some 20, I mean, it's spanning a 20 year period. We start from the Vilm. And so the focus really was on marine protected areas, to be quite honest. Um, it's subsequent to the beginning of the negotiations that issues such as plastics and climate change really became very prominent. And so I think now um, the, the, one of the questions is how to incorporate these without necessarily changing the focus of the agreement. So clearly plastics, pollution, climate change, these are all part of healthy oceans, building resilience, and it fits into the whole uh, purpose and objective of establishing area-based management tools, marine protected areas, uh, environmental impact assessments. Um, but again, marine plastics is a, is a land-based, um, uh, it's very land-based. I mean, most of it's coming from 
some from fisheries, of course, but most of it from land-based sources. So it's also a question that has arisen is the relationship between you know, land, the, the land-based activities, and of course, uh, the high seas. Um, but I think the objective or the intent would be um, to have, have that link in there somehow. And it may be as part of the MPAs, the EIAs, um, but I think we realize that you can't be, you can't exclude um, these very important sources. So the UNA is not directly linked, but the issues, of course, I think are being taken into consideration. Thank you so much. So I think we'll have to leave it there. We're almost at the hour. Um, if any, everyone could just join me in giving Dr. Rao um, little hands uh, uh, to substitute him <laughs> for the applause. Thank you so much for um, coming along to the Law and Nature Dialogue. And thank you, Dr. Oral, for your insights, you. especially with these questions. So, um, uh, and for everybody who's watching, who might have missed some of it, this will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Really. Thank you. It was great and wonderful questions.